What is a demand letter? Well, here is an example, and now I'm going to go over the seven different elements that make up a demand letter. First thing you want to do in every demand letter is introduce the cause of your problem. For example, dear neighbors, we've been neighbors for years, we've always gotten along fine. Recently, however, you purchased a hound that has done nothing but bark every day, all day, at all hours of the day. Number two, explain your attempts to solve the problem. I have tried to talk to you about this problem on a number of occasions. You assured me the problem would be addressed. To date, it has not. Number three, state the nature and the seriousness of the problem. My wife and I have lost substantial amounts of sleep. This has impacted our work performance. We've also become edgy and irritable towards one another. Number four, state your demand. It is with regret we must now formally demand that you stop allowing your dog outside. Number five, suggest alternative solutions. Unless you muzzle it or have its vocal cords surgically removed, or perhaps giving the dog away would be the best solution to the problem. Number six, state the deadline for response. I would hate for this dog to cause the end of our friendship, but we are at wit's end. This matter is not solved to our satisfaction within two weeks. Number seven, state the consequences if your demand is not met. We'll be forced to seek an award of damages in small claims court. Now, if you have a claim that's related to a bad check, meaning you tried to go to the bank and the check bounced, you can always write a demand letter and under civil code 1719, after you send it by certified mail, ask the judge for the amount owed on the check plus three times the amount of the check. So it's well worth it to write that demand letter. Also, it's also worth it to ask an attorney to write your demand letter. They can put the relevant law or code in the letter. It will go on their letterhead. Be a little more forceful, more likely the other party might respond. Now, what if the other party does not respond? It's still worth it to write that letter. First, you're showing the other party you're being reasonable. And second, when you go to court, you can turn this letter in as part of your evidence and say, look, Your Honor, I took the first shot at solving the dispute outside of court. What is mediation? Well, mediation is exactly what it looks like in this picture. You have a third neutral party called a mediator who's helping both sides come to a mutual, satisfactory solution. Listed here are the benefits to medi mediation. First and foremost, it's confidential. So nothing you say in that room can be used against you at court. If you don't come to agreement, you can still sue the other party in court. And if you do, it won't affect your credit record. It's also very inexpensive, a lot more inexpensive than hiring an attorney. And it's fairly quick. Many mediation can be resolved within one hour. It's empowering because rather than allowing a judge to decide for you, you guys are making the decision yourselves. And two other benefits include that it is restorative. If you have a problem with a family member, a friend, a business partner, you have a much better likelihood of having a harmonious relationship with that person after mediation versus suing them in court. And it allows for creative solutions. A judge can only assist you with a problem that has already occurred in the past and is related to money. Whereas a mediator can assist you with a problem that has occurred, could occur, related to money, not related to money. But the only catch is that it's voluntary. So even if you want to go, you might not be able to go if the other party doesn't agree. But it's always available to you before the judgment. This is the general mediation process. First, you will contact your local mediation center. There might be one actually at your court. They will contact the other party, either in writing or by telephone, and ask them for their permission. If they agree, you will both meet in a room for about two to three hours, usually without any witnesses. There'll be at least two to three volunteer experienced mediators helping you guys come to a solution. If there is one, they'll write it out for you, kind of like a contract. You'll both sign it, and then there'll be a small fee split between both of you. If you don't have mediation before the day of court, it is available to you on the day of court. And this is an example of the process. You will first arrive to the courthouse and you'll check into a mediation desk if there is one. You'll enter the courtroom, and the clerk or the bailiff will ask you to raise your hand and say an oath. And they'll also ask you to step outside and exchange documents, and tell you that this is your last chance to settle a dispute with mediation. If the other party agrees, and you agree, you'll both go to a room for about 45 minutes. If there's an agreement, the mediator will write up for you, Present the agreement to the judge, the judge will dismiss your case. Or what might happen is you don't want to mediate or your other party doesn't want to mediate 
And so you'll go straight to the hearing. What I want you to notice about this drawing right here is that you only have about 45 minutes on the day of court to mediate. So although mediation is very successful, it's not as successful on the day of court simply because you have less time. Now we're going to talk to the plaintiff. We're going to pretend that you tried to write that demand letter. It didn't work. There was no response. You tried to urge the party to go to mediation. They didn't want to go. Or you went and there's no agreement. Now you're ready to go to court. What are you going to need? You're going to need two forms. The first one is called the plaintiff's claim. The second is called the proof of service. The other three forms you may need depending on your situation. For example, if you plan on suing more than two defendants, you'll need the SC100A. If you plan on suing on behalf of your business and your business has a fictitious business name, which is a name that suggests other owners, you'll need the SC104. And if you're low income and you might qualify, you can ask to apply for a fee waiver. The most important form we just mentioned is the first one, the SC100, because this is the only thing that the judge will see before he or she hears your case. So it's very important to fill out it correctly, because if you don't, you might have to start all over again. Section one of the form asks for your name and your address as a plaintiff. We can all do that. Section two asks for defendant's name and defendant's address. Now, this can be a little difficult if you don't know where defendant lives. We will cover that very soon. But it can also be difficult if you're suing a business and you're not sure how to name the business. You can ask your local clerk's office, small claims clerks, and ask them how to write the defendant's name on your form. It's very important to name your defendant correctly because you can only collect from the person whose name is on that judgment. Now we're going to look at Section 3. Section 3 asks how much money does the defendant owe you? In that box, you're going to put what's called money damages. This could be money owed to you under a contract. It could be money that you paid out of pocket for medical expenses or to repair something. Even money to punish someone if they did something willfully or maliciously to you. Whatever you put in that box, just make sure that you can prove it to the judge through witnesses, photos, receipts, contracts. This is all called evidence, and we'll get into it more later. And remember that you cannot write a number in that box that exceeds $7,500. Now, you can ask for court costs, and this will be added on top of your judgment, but this you're not going to think of at the time of filling out the form. You're going to ask for court costs at the time of your hearing. Now, this is an example of how to fill out the SC100 called the plaintiff's claim. And what I want you to notice is that it's a fairly simple form. There's not a lot to fill out. In fact, the most complex question says, why does the defendant owe you money? Now, I know if someone owed me money, I could write paragraphs and paragraphs why someone owes me something. But here, they just give you one or two lines to write one or two sentences. And then in layer C, it says, how did you calculate this money owed to you? If you can't fit your response on that one line that they give you, you can feel free to attach the MC031, which is a declaration. It's a blank form where you can write under the penalty of perjury one paragraph of how you came up with that magic number. This is all you're going to turn into the judge before your hearing. All that proof that you have, the receipts, the photos, the contracts, you're going to bring that with you on the day of court. The judge will not read it beforehand. 